TV radio listeners, this is Lonnie Clark with the Age of Fission radio show. Thank you for joining us today. It is, can you believe it, August 8th, 2016, how it flies by. This is Monday, and as you know, I like to interview activists and discuss the situation in St. Louis. Today we have the great honor of having uh, Kay Dry from Beyond Nuclear and a St. Louis activist who has devoted much of her life to uh, really rebalancing the processes of life. And uh, thank you, Kay, for joining us. I'm thrilled to have you with us. I'll introduce you right away. Well, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, well, right before the show, we were talking about your uh, little speech uh, that you gave last night. You were asked to give a speech uh, at a Hiroshima Nagasaki Memorial in St. Louis. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, at, at the uh huh, the Ethical Society. It was it was very nice. Ethical yeah. Society. That is what we need is ethics. That's. I mean, this issue about the n- pollution, not just nuclear, but all of the pollution that is really just part of what I wanted to ask you about because I know that you were a civil rights activist, correct? Before you got right. involved uh-huh. in this. I have long felt that this is a civil rights issue because our civil rights have been taken away from us. We never were asked about this. I mean, right. So perhaps you could talk about what you said last night because it sounds like we were sort of in the same vein of thought uh, somehow on this one. Well, right. I guess that la- we were taking note of the Hiroshima Nagasaki monstrosities, really. Um, and in St. Louis uh, has the unfortunate distinction of having some of the oldest radioactive waste of the atomic age. We purified all the uranium that went into the world's first self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction under the football field at the University of Chicago. Um, and this, in and in, in, um, in, then this, of course, led to the creation of the atom bomb and and I think people were happy in in the United States when they they actually dropped two bombs on Japan which was you know we thought that was great victory at least when I was a child and and you know we know more now about how the terribly terrible devastation and I guess when I was growing up, I was a Jewish child living in a neighborhood where there were just Protestants and, and some Catholic people and, and the kids in the neighborhood. I was in the second grade, and they tied me up to a tree and threw snowballs at me because 
I had killed Christ, whom I had never heard of. Oh, my god! And it was, it, it was very terrifying to me. But growing up with a lot of children who were actually religious Protestants by the most, in the most part, and I ended up going to Sunday school with them sometimes, my friends, they became my friends. But it was, you know, it was a real experience, and seeing how people could... Uh, and t- treat other people, you know, was really frightening to me. And I remember g- when they tied me up and threw snowballs at me, I ran home and hid in my little bedroom. And we were renting a little house. For th- I, neither of my parents had ever lived in a house before, and we were very excited. But it was very devastating for me. Um, to You know, I didn't understand what it meant about being Jewish and that these very pro- religious Protestant kids thought it was awful that a Jewish person had moved into this rental home on their block. And so, at any rate, I, so I sort of had to understand minority attitudes and, and what it means to be not in the majority, and I ended up being interested in civil rights and working with black people who were not able to get housing, not able to get jobs, and so forth. And I majored in college. I majored in anthropology, cultural anthropology, to try to understand more about prejudice and what could we do about it. And I worked in civil rights, helping people get housing and so forth and jobs for many years until I then found out about nuclear power, which was, and nuclear weapons, really, too, um, that was, you know, an an assault on on all living people, um, regardless of race or religion or background. So I guess they kind of all work together, and and I think we just have to learn how to have people get along and how to have a safe environment in which we can all live in our in our country. You know, one of the things I think we really need to relearn is how to face it. So many people, in fact, I lost a, a dear friend of mine this weekend told me, you know what, if you can't stop talking about this, I don't ever want to discuss it. Like, I don't know how people can go their lives and not discuss the nuclear contamination that's enveloping our planet. For me, it's a statement of humanity to discuss it and be willing to face it. Right. And I guess when I spoke last night, um, because we were commemorating the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, I, I... in 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 St. Louis was where they figured out how to purify the all the uranium that was how to purify uranium to make atom bombs. And everything was of course done very secretively, and I guess when I as I we're trying to get still some of the radioactive waste that was dumped all over various places in St. Louis, and we have one site that is still not yet cleaned up and they're pretending they can just leave some of these radioactive waste from the 1940s and 50s that were processed here in St. Louis. They think they can leave them in the floodplain of of the Missouri River, and which is just crazy, and they, they should be dug up and taken somewhere dry and away from people, actually, if there is such a place. And I think... I guess we, you know, when when the atom bomb was created and then, and I was a child when they bombed Hiroshima and and Nagasaki and everyone. Well, I was born in 33, 1933, so it was 45, 1945. So that must have been very hard for you post-World War II as a Jewish child in America because there was a lot of prejudice against German people and the whole that whole thing about all of it like there you must have really suffered quite a bit emotionally well it, it made me you know sort of realize because i was surrounded by protestants and some of them were particular very religious uh protestants and it, i think the more religious they were and committed to their churches it seemed to me the more prejudiced they were um, but at any rate, they became my friends, and, and st- st- some still are to this day, although we're much, much older. And I, I guess I, I just, I, I think I learned that you can have success in learning to get along with people, and I think that means people from all over the world, and it means people of all races and backgrounds. 
we just have to learn to do it. We think of our world as being great big, but it, it's one world, one bunch of air, one bunch of water, basically, and, and we have to protect the planet, and we have to protect all the people within the planet. And, I, and when I spoke last night um, about, because of the, you know, we were commemorating the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings, which ended World War II, and I was very happy about that. So what did we figure? I was like 12 years old or something. Everyone was very happy that the war was, yes. was over. And I, um, and so now, though, we're still here in St. Louis. We have some of the very oldest, actually the oldest, radioactive waste of the atomic age because here in St. Louis we purified all and processed all the uranium that went in to the world's first nuclear weapons. And so um, and we're trying to get some of the final radioactively contaminated sites cleaned up in, in the metropolitan St. Louis. And I said we need safe air, safe land, and safe Missouri, Mississippi River drinking water. Seventy years ago, I was, this was from my talk last night, 70 years ago, we dropped radioactive poisons on Japan. Now we must remove these same permanent toxins those that we used to kill and hurt so many Japanese people, we must remove those away from our St. Louis human environment. So we have these same, you know, we have these contaminants left over in various places in St. Louis, which we've been cleaning up. And there are also contamination from nuclear weapons production um, and explosions. Uh, elsewhere, and you know, all of these materials must be cleaned up, and of course, that also includes the same kinds of poisons that they are creating at nuclear power plants and nuclear weapons plants. So we have a lot of work to do, and but we have to be hopeful that we can all get together and understand that these cleanups must happen, and believe in trying to have a pure, clean planet again. We just have to work on that. Yeah, I agree with you. We have to believe that it's possible that we can remediate, that we can recover. Because right now, I think that's a lot of the sentiment among the people that I talk to. That's why they don't want to face it. They don't believe that we can actually recover. They figure, well, we're just going to have to deal with it the best we can instead of... I really believe that once we face this... I mean, we've had 70 years of the nuclear industry and 100 years of the chemical industry just denying and ignoring and refusing to tr make an effort to spend money to remediate and to reverse the negative effects of the environment. They've just, not just kicking the can down the road, they kick the can and then bury it with dirt. You know what I mean? Like, that's been their method. Of, that's, in fact, what caused Westlake landfill. They just buried it with dirt. Literally. Right. And I mean, that is obviously not the correct answer. <laughs> yeah, they, they really, you know, because we, St. Louis, in St. Louis, the Mallinckrodt Chemical Works people downtown on the, along the Mississippi River figured out how to purify tons of, the tons of uranium that were needed in order to make nuclear weapons. And then they, they began generating these horrible toxic materials in 1942 and continued here in metropolitan St. Louis uh, for 25 years and leaving behind a lot of radioactive waste. And, and I guess in, in a lot of cases, um, and they did these things in areas where they either thought, you know, they didn't do them like in, in fancy neighborhoods, for goodness sake, goodness sake. But they also didn't even admit that they would be contaminating. In the case of downtown Mallinckrodt, first they contaminated the Mississippi River um, from runoff from the factories and releases. And then, then they moved some of the waste out to be along the Missouri River. And, you know, we treat our rivers in our nation and our world in many cases as you know, places where we can dump poisons and we, we think of our air, you know, we release things, poisons into the air, gases and particulate materials. And as if we think, you know, this air is somehow going to going to be clean, but it isn't. So we just have to try and appreciate our planet and honor it and not keep 
contaminating it. And I think the public has been working on these issues, and I think they should feel hopeful because I think more and more people are recognizing uh, how important this is to have clean air, clean water, clean land. We have only one planet that we're sharing with one another. You know what's really astounding is that we actually, that our government created these, say, this whole process. This was a government project, the Manhattan Project in St. Louis. This was not a private industry issue. This was a government project. And I'm just dumbfounded that even, you know, in the last month, your own senators voted to defund the fuse wrap like they instead of standing up and saying no we're not passing this budget we're not going to defund fuse wrap we need more money for fuse wrap they just i i have reduced to say, reduced the amount i i, I yes, don't think they, they, did, de- they yeah. didn't yeah, they didn't. They, they didn't, didn't increase it. What we need is, yeah, we they needed. Redu- they reduced it. They re- and every year it's been reduced since 2010. When in fact, around 2000, you know, in 10 and in 2011, they knew for a fact that you guys had an increased awareness of a situation that caused an emergency in St. Louis. It, it, I, I find that to be a, a gross uh, violation of our civil rights. If you ask me, because we don't well, have a we don't we have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in our country. And as John Goffman said in his book, The Irreverent Guide to Nuclear Power, you know that has been robbed from us because we right. can. I mean, and this is where I'm just like I I I want to urge people that we can make a difference. That it does matter if we not just. You know, that's what I wanted to ask you, because you you began in this awareness, like it started in 1942 when you were just a young kid. So by the time you were a young woman, and at what point did we realize in our society that these nuclear power plants were harmful? They didn't tell us for 20, 30 years that they had this waste, did they? I mean, at yeah, what they, point no. did you become aware that these things were dangerous? Right, well... By the time they began talking about the building, uh, they wanted to build two reactors in Missouri. And, you know, by then we, we knew that they were, many of us knew that they were dangerous. And people in other parts of the country had been trying to get their nuclear plants shut down. And I guess I began paying attention to the fact that any nu- every nuclear power plant releases radioactive long-lived and very dangerous radioactive materials into the air and into the water, um, you know, as a part of the routine operation of the plant. And so that, and, and that we really have no place on the planet Earth to put the radioactive waste that we're generating, you know, the, to keep it away from the air and water and land that we need to survive as, as members of the, of the of the world, and so we just, I just think that we, no one really told us that every time there's a nuclear power plant operating that it is routinely releasing radioactive hydrogen into the, called water, radioactive water with radioactive hydrogen in it, and that's called tritium, that it's released into the air and into the water wherever they're getting their cooling water for the power plant. Around the clock, they cannot filter these materials, and therefore they're not required to filter them. They, ha- they can filter some of the radioactive poisons that they generate at, at nuclear power facilities, but they can't filter all of them, like radioactive hydrogen or tritium. So a lot of the facts about nuclear power and also about the production of nuclear weapons, I think those facts were and still are being hidden from the public. I don't think the public knows how pervasive these poisons are that they're releasing into our environment. And and yet, I believe, you know, they're shutting down nuclear power plants in our country. And I guess partly they complain about the financing of nuclear power. It's, it's expensive and it's expen- expensive to operate and, and other kinds of power generation are cheaper and safer. And so I think, you know, we're not building new nuclear power plants and we're 
shutting down more and more of them because they're expensive to build. We should be shutting them all down because they're immoral to operate. Yeah, we should be shutting them down. Well, and when you speak about tritium, you know, there was a story. This is the thing that I don't understand. It was pretty nationally well-known. The tritium in New York City is 65,000% over the acceptable level. It's going into their drinking water. Wow. and And yet just this weekend or the last two weeks, Chuck Schumer and the uh, New York, you know, they they have just said that keeping New York uh, Indian Point open, which is leaking the tritium, is a necessity. They've deemed it a public necessity. And they are completely ignoring the fact that tritium is still leaking. It's operating without a license. There are It's missing 18 bolts. They've dropped bolts in there. They ha- have no idea where these bolts have gone. It's a very dangerous plant. And yet they say, well, it provides 20%, 30% of our electricity. The electricity will be too expensive. And they're keeping it open to add a massive risk to public health. It is right. I find that to be a violation of people's civil rights. Like this is people ask me how I can continue to be involved, you know, and talk about it because I feel like our rights are being robbed from us. Like right before our very eyes. Like that's been one of the issues with this election. There's been allegations of election fraud that you know, I called the San Diego County of Registrars to find out if the story was true that there's a million votes that were found shredded. And do you know they have not returned my phone call? Oh, my goodness. So yeah. I am planning on pursuing that, I guarantee you. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, but I that's mean, good. It's just, okay, how, yeah, well, I, you know, you, know, when, I, you were around when Dr. Caldecott got a million people in the streets. Like, you were there when all, when the the height of this, I think, when the shakedown came was when they killed Karen Silkwood. That wasn't that the first day you gave your first speech on nuclear. My first Remember public you, speech, that's you right. Told me that, that was so. November 13, 1974. And of course, I hadn't heard of Karen Silkwood the day, she, you know, she, the day she was killed. But I, I, it was the day I made my first public speech. And, and I had been working on trying to preserve forest land and not open space for people to enjoy the outdoors, to protect our rivers and lakes and so forth. And uh, I was, I was, my husband was a tree farmer, and I was very much involved in, in environmental issues and also in civil rights issues. But, you know, then when... It, as it happened, I, I just saw, I saw an older woman, and she knew I w- always worked on sort of uphill battles and lost causes and so forth. And she asked me one night, she said, are you going to be speaking at the hearing tomorrow, which was November thirteenth, 1974, and there was to be a hearing about should we have a nuclear power plant in Missouri, and it was a hearing before the St. Louis County Council. And I had thought about going and speaking, or at least I certainly wanted to attend. And I did speak, actually. That was my first public speech on nuclear power. And I decided that I would stop working on civil rights, which was what I was mostly doing, and and just work on fighting against nuclear power, because the more I read about it and the radioactive waste that is generated around the clock uh, at every nuclear power plant and it is also generated when they make nuclear weapons as well but i you know i thought it doesn't matter if we if we have a a a, clean, a a a nice you know planet if if we can't drink the water and if we can't you know live safely so i've been fighting nuclear power ever since and and we just it's not an acceptable technology it's very expensive which is why some of the uh, wiser electric electric utilities are shutting down their plants now in the United States and they're not building more. There are a couple plants under construction, but I don't think they'll ever be completed in this country. And so, you know, I think we can be hopeful to that extent, but also, you know, the fact that we've been generating these awful radioactive materials and like my favorite isotope, I call it my favorite, which is tritium, which is radioactive hydrogen, and the, hyd- the tritium that's created today in a nuclear power plant, uh, has, it has a half-life of over 12 years, and you have to multiply the half-life by at least 10 to, long, to find out how long 
tritium, for instance, will be releasing radioactive beta particles into our atmosphere, into the air we breathe and the water we drink. And, and so I, I, tritium is my least favorite isotope, it's, and it's on my license plate, and they cannot filter tritium from the, a nu- an operating nuclear power plant. It, water is hydrogen and oxygen, and there's no technologically feasible way to remove the radioactive hydrogen from water that's being that is in being contaminated in a nuclear power plant. So since there's no financially feasible way to to filter radioactive hydrogen from H2O hydrogen and oxygen which is water, since there's no way to filter the tritium, they're not required to filter it. So it's not just leaks of radioactive tritium but around the clock, every nuclear power plant is releasing radioactive hydrogen or tritium as a part of the water that they use for cooling and operating the plant. So it releases, uh, not just leaks. It's, it's, they cannot do it technologically. There's no so. economically feasible way to filter tritium, so they're not required to. And when I first learned about tritium, I called a health physicist at Washington University here in St. Louis, and I said, could you please tell me about the hazards of tritium? And he said, quotes, tritium is no big deal. All it can do is destroy a DNA molecule. And I said to this health physicist, I said, you know, I don't want my DNA molecules destroyed or my children's DNA molecules (laughs) destroyed or anyone else. I mean, they cannot have nuclear power and, of course, nuclear weapons without creating and releasing to the environment uh, horrible, long-lived, very dangerous radioactive poisons. Well, look, isn't... Yeah, so wait, this is the... I, I'm sort of dumbfounded with the information you just unloaded on us, so to be honest. like, But, uh, you know, when they say that the amount of tritium, the, uh, quote, allowable levels of tritium that are allowed, it's 65,000% higher in New York drinking water. So what you're telling me is that every, they've allowed tritium going into the, like in your, you have the Callaway nuclear power plant that ended up, did getting built right on the Missouri River that seems to flow down through St. Charles, fluorescent, and into the Mississippi River. Is that correct? And into St. Louis, yeah, we drink that. Missouri River water that comes from the Callaway nuclear plant. And we were going to have two reactors, but then we did a statewide petition drive and vote, and we said that we would not pay for the construction of any power plant uh, until it was operable and used and used for service. So at the time when we started the petition drive to put this on the ballot and then had the vote at that time, they were planning to build two reactors. So we did kill one reactor. We only, they only built one reactor. But every nuclear power plant uses lots and lots of water uh, every minute. That's something like 20,000 gallons per minute, something wild. And, and, and they take in, you know, water hydrogen and oxygen, but when they release the water and use it for for cooling purposes and so forth in order to run a nuclear power plant, but that water, that the, the hydrogen becomes radioactive and has a half-life of 12 years, which means it'll be around at least for 10 times that long, which means like 120 years, so the tritium or radio... Pardon me? Um... The tritium has a half-life of 100 Of 12 years, and you have to, in order to find, so in, in 12 years, half of the tritium that is created will have been um, given off, it will have given off its beta radiation particles. But then it takes another, another 12 years, another half, and so forth. So you have to figure a certain number of half-lives between, before all that radioactive hydrogen has... Um, 
lost its radioactivity, has given off its beta, ra- beta particles, its radioactive okay, particles. Okay, so let me ask you this. I just, while we were chatting, I looked up the WikiLeaks on tritium health risks. And in this it says that it has a short biological half-life in the, hum- to the, in the human body of 7 to 14 days, which both reduces the total effects of single incident ingestion and precludes long-term bioaccumulation. This sounds like it was written by the nuclear industry, doesn't it? It. I'm sure it was written. Full of half <laughs> lives because this is what it says. It's not it's not dangerous externally, but it's internally where it's hazardous. But it's going into our water. That's so, right. It's going into like, our drinking water gonna, and into into the air we breathe as well. In other words, there's tritium in the radioactive steam. When you see a cooling tower at a nuclear power plant, you see this very impressive steam coming out of the top of the cooling tower. That has tritium in it. And that tritium, which has a 12-year half-life, which you have to multiply a half-life by at least 10 to figure out how long it'll be before a particular bunch of tritium, let's say, has given off its radioactive particles. So the tritium that is going into the air and into the water from an operating nuclear power plant, a tritium molecule will have our atom will have a 12-year half-life, but you have to multiply the half-life by at least 10. I used to be taught by at least 20 to know how long you know a particular amount of radioactive material will give off its radioactive particles and rays. So we, they generate a lot of tritium in just a regular nuclear, operating nuclear power plant. Some of that Radioactive tritium is released into the water, into the lake or ocean where they're getting a river where the, from which they get their cooling water that they need a lot of to operate the plant. So they take in a certain amount of water every minute, and if some of that water becomes radioactive while it's in the plant being you know used for cooling, and then some of that radioactive water is released as water back into the river, lake, or ocean, and some of it is released as steam into the air and settles on the ground. And, you know, tritium has a half-life of 12.3 years, so you have to multiply the half-life by at least 10 to know how long it will. So that tritium will continue giving off beta particles. So, you know, tritium, that's why I guess it's when I began finding out about it. And, you know, when I, maybe I said this already, but when the health physicist, I think I did say that, he said, you know, tritium is no big deal. All it can do is destroy a DNA molecule. Well, you know, it is dangerous, and it is not something that you want people to have to drink and farmers to, to put, have to put on their fields and crops and so, and it's just one of hundreds of different kinds of horrible radioactive materials that are generated in a, every operating nuclear power plant, and also that we have, of course, when we have nuclear weapons to worry about. You know, those are the same kinds of radioactive poisons that are released into the environment. I have to say that I am just like, as I listen, I'm just feeling completely dumbfounded and it it what brings to my mind is that every a our government is fully invested in nuclear producing nuclear waste period they they have produced so much of it that at this point they're choosing to ignore it and second the way they've handled to ignore it is everything opposite as an american i was raised to believe we stood for I honestly, like, for me, I guess this is where my outrage is, uh, like, thinking about this in a civil rights way. This is, I think, the facts really are, to me, at this point, meaningless. We have Fukushima going on for five years, and we've discovered that we have had a nuclear monster growing in St. Louis of a magnitude that we have not even really looked at like we're just now beginning to see it and we're living with the uh health risks of a massive experiment that has failed that we are now paying scientists money to figure out a way to keep it going instead of like turning it down do you get what i'm saying like it goes against everything in my mind that as americans i think that we are right it's 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 disheartening really i think most people 
think that, let's say, nuclear power plants are dangerous only if there's an accident. They don't realize about these routine releases of poisons into the air and into the water. And this is, you know, there's a certain amount of water on our planet, and and there's a certain amount providing drinking water for us here, in, let's say, in the United States. But, you know, we're, these these nuclear power plants and nuclear weapons production plants are producing these radioactive materials for which there really is no good place to isolate them. And I, I just wish there were more honesty from the federal government about that. And I wish the citizens could have a chance to say, do you want to keep drinking, let's say, Missouri River water or Mississippi River water or water from the Atlantic Ocean or water that's been contaminated by Fukushima and so forth, we, we should, they should, they should say, do you want us to keep doing this? Do you want us to keep contaminating the limited amount of water we have on our planet? And I think that I just cannot believe that any Americans would say, yes, we want to continue generating these materials. These are man-made radioactive wastes. That's what we're generating. We don't have to do that, and we should not we should not do it. And I think if the public were given the facts, they would not would not want to do this to our planet, to our people living here all over the planet, and well, and other animals and plants. Well, it's like there was a huge push in New York City to shut down the Indian Point nuclear power plant, and that is just being. I mean, Chuck Schumer, who's a senator. Basically, is the person saying, "Look, it, we're, it's a, it, we need it for the public." In your own state, uh, Claire McCaskill, who I contributed money to to elect, vote just voted to cut down the fuse wrap budget. Like she said, she gave she gave a yes vote on that so that the budget would pass out of pure pressure. I am sure. I mean. It's beyond comprehension that our elected officials go to Washington, D.C. and get so disconnected from the trauma that's going on in their own states. It's, it's unbelievable. Right. I, I, don't, I guess I hadn't somehow that fact passed me by that she voted to re- reduce the, food, the, the, the budget that we need right here in St. Louis, for example, right. to remove radioactive waste that were generated during World War II some of the hottest radioactive wastes anywhere, and we had them dumped illegally uh, at, at a, in a landfill in the Missouri River floodplain. So, you know, they're in contact with the Missouri River water, and it goes into um, into uh, the, the drinking water that we have here, but then on into the Mississippi River and so forth. Well, how often I, have you guys been flooded since the since those things were dumped? I mean, oh well, we have we have the Missouri River floods. It floods. It's one of the most really? flood prone rivers on the planet. Right. Yeah. It, so there's a lot of flooding uh, because it's in the floodplain. You know, there aren't houses there. We had a lawsuit actually. We, we were successful to a certain extent. They were going to build a new town in town right near. Westlake Landfill uh, in the Missouri River floodplain, and we had a lawsuit, and unfortunately, we couldn't stop them from building a certain amounts of, of like, warehouses and stuff in the floodplain, but, you know, floodplains, people need to study them, they need to find out about them in their own communities, you know, where, where their rivers located, and where did the, where did the rivers flood, and so forth, so we have flooding here, Missouri River floods tremendously all over the country. So I don't know. I just, and I guess sometimes I feel sort of helpless or that, you know, it's such a huge uphill battle. But more and more citizens are expressing concerns about having clean water and clean air. And and I think they should just keep more many people are working on these issues and i feel hopeful in that respect you know is that more people become informed um including young people or particularly young people i feel more hopeful that we can have some some help for all this um and that we'll get the government to understand that we shouldn't be allowed to contaminate the missouri river and the mississippi river and a 
And I just still can't believe that there is a nuclear power plant that Indian Point in New York City, you know, is right there contaminating the Hudson River. I mean, Indian Point is dumping... Million, millions of people. Millions yeah, of people. Yeah, that's right. 65,000%. This story was written in February. I was like, I couldn't believe it. And now... What did you say? 65,000 what? Percent over what they say is the allowable limit exposure. Yeah, well, the allowable limits are not humane either. <laughs> We right. shouldn't have any allowable limits for tritium, for instance. Well, but. what's going to happen, though, is ultimately, you know, we're going to see, in, just like we saw in, uh, and it goes uncounted, just as in Bridgeton, just as in, in St. Louis, people are going to have birth defects, they're going to have cancers, and no one, since our government, I think this, frankly, this is one of the reasons why our government does not want single-payer health care, because if we had single-payer health care, oncology reports and oncology statistics would be readily available. We could track where the cancers are. We could easily, because it's so, you know, it would be all on one system. Right now we have it disjointed. Nobody keeps track. Like, people in yeah. New York City are going to see a spike in cancers, birth defects, things like that, that no doubt, and, you know, autism, a bunch of things that, frankly, they get to use us like assets on a balance sheet. We pay them for our health insurance, and then they squeeze every last dime, and then they go to the government and keep squeezing. It's it, For me, it's just so unconscionable. This is why I, I can't. It's a civil rights issue. I just can't get off of this idea that how people can just allow our rights as citizens and as human beings on this planet to just be stripped away by an industry, by an entire technological system, not just nuclear, but just the whole system of refusing to face that they are causing harm and just allow them to continue to deny, deny, deny. It's like... At what point are we going to demand honesty out of the scientists? I mean, I have a protest sign, Kay, that says, when scientists lie, people die. Oh, right. Well, I, or when they're silent, you know, when the scientists are silent, when they know these things. Um, you know, that's another way of... You have been at this so long. I have to thank you so much for your diligence for this. And, you know, it, beyond nuclear, it's like you guys have, have been the stalwarts, like sort of the, there have just been few, when I first found out about the nuclear thing, to be honest, I was stunned. I had no idea. And I, there are just not a lot of people who are willing to hang together to keep doing this because the fight is so hard. Like, it's not just from the government. People don't want to talk about it. Right, they don't want to talk about it, or they may feel like with me, I don't have a science background. I have a bachelor's degree in cultural anthropology because I was interested in race relations and happened to love Native Americans, American Indians, have all my life. And so I didn't, I don't have much science background, um, but I think. I'm just hopeful, you know, I am on the board of an organization called Beyond Nuclear out of the Washington, D.C. area, and we try to give these in, this information to the public and other volunteer organizations do the same. And I think the public is becoming better informed, but I think, you know, like with when you mentioned Indian Point, and, you know, as I said, I just find it impossible to believe that many people in New York City know that the Hudson River is being contaminated by the Indian Point reactor around the clock. And the air they breathe also has, you know, my favorite isotope, tritium, radioactive hydrogen. Is That's going into the air that New York City people are drinking, I'm sorry, are breathing, and into the Hudson River and into, you know, other bodies of water that we're, you know, we're doing this to our planet. And it's it's not necessary. I'm very hopeful about various clean energies that are being generated, and people, you know, I, I think, I think, and I think there's more honesty about contamination. So I'm hopeful, or, or I wouldn't work as hard as I do. I think, I think, I think those of us who work on uphill battles are basically optimists, or we wouldn't be. Yeah. 
True you that. know, we're 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 hopeful, and and that's what we're doing. But I I guess I you know I I think we just. We just we have to keep trying to let people know what the what the what the facts are, but I don't understand even how anyone can work at a nuclear power plant. Or, and now we're not only you know we're not only still operating a bunch of reactors here in the United States, but we're we're making more nuclear weapons, and I find that also to be so absolutely unacceptable in Kansas well, City, Missouri. The, the, the reason is is because the people that are working there, Kate, genuinely do not believe that it's harmful. They are convinced that we are misinformed and being upset over nothing. They look at their community and they say, yes, we have higher risks of cancer, but we have a really great medical industry that can save most of us. I mean, what they really deny is that over the long term, 95, 97% of the people who go through chemo, who go through radiological therapy, end up dying within the short term. They don't make it 10 years. It does not, it's a, the whole industry is a failed industry, but it's all, uh, 100%, it supports the only industry that the United States has, and that's war. That's that. Until we get to that place where we can admit that our country really is a warring nation, we're not. This is why our civil rights are being taken away and have been stripped since the Unpatriot Act was passed. All of our government passed the Patriot Act, the NDAA. We now get spied on. I mean, this is not some novel. This is a reality in our country right now. If the government wanted to go into your house while you're at the grocery store and do a sneak and peek and look around your house and poke around, they have a legal right to go into your house anytime they want, thanks to the Patriot Act. Not one of our elected officials will revoke that little bit of a law. In the name of security, they have taken away all of our liberty. Well, we just have to, I guess we have to somehow remain hopeful that people like you who are putting programs on the on the radio that people can hear and think about uh i i you know i i guess we have to maintain hope and you actually you may sound like you don't maintain hope but you you wouldn't I be do. working so hard with your radio program and other efforts that you do if, if, I didn't have if hope, you weren't I hopeful that's right if you I are hopeful hope, if i didn't have any real belief in the future and really especially as an American I really love our, our constitution I go back to our constitution we have a framework that has been ignored and legally challenged and it is time for us this is why I frankly at 60 years old I'm in college and I am going to school to become an attorney I am going to work on revoking the Price Anderson Act that's how for 70 years they have gotten away with literally bloody murder and what they're doing in St. Louis, they're passing the ball around as a foundation based on the Price-Anderson Act. It can't be used as a, its foundation because it's a, fundamentally a military project. But they still are using it as a reference. And it is an unconscionable thing to think that we have a legal right to destroy our environment and take away people's civil liberties for the protection of the homeland. Like, it's like I told Ron Wyden, he said, well, he couldn't talk to us about Fukushima anymore because it's been deemed a national security thing. And so it's under the Patriot Act and they can't tell me about it. I said, so you're telling me that you guys have deemed Fukushima to be a threat to our country, but you can't tell me what the threat is. You can't talk to me about any of it. They said, no, ma'am, we can't. Wow. I, I, I said, you know what? It is time for you. I said, I would like the senator to break the unpatriot. I call it the unpatriot act. I refuse to be respectful and call it the patriot act. It's the unpatriot act. And I think I said, you know, if he got six or seven senators who refused to keep the broke the silence, they're not going to throw all these senators in jail. They're not going to arrest them and put everybody in jail. This is what we need. We need conscientious objectors at a high level. Like, for me, it is unconscionable that Edward Snowden is considered a criminal and that Chelsea Manning is considered a criminal. They are heroes in my book as far as Americans go. I'm just dumbfounded well, that we're supposed to protect murderers. Right. Well, I, I think we should, we just have to maintain a little bit of hope, Lonnie, <laughs> that 
people like you who are trying to get these facts to the public, I think they are making a difference. I think young people um, ha- have been hearing things that make them more uh, reflective and, and cautious about what they believe. I don't mean all young people, but there are, I think there's an increased awareness among the American public and people elsewhere in the world. Uh, they're willing to listen to both sides of a story. Um, it's just unfortunately that our side that is working for a clean environment and clean air and water and and land, um, you know, I, we don't have equal access to the public. That's unfortunate. You know, we don't have enough media people like you on our side to give the facts to the public. But I, I'm, I guess I'm basically hopeful that young people are finding out about some of these secrets that we've kept from our people. Um, Me too. I, and I think that many of them are, are willing to go, you know what, we don't have the answers, but we need to start looking right now. And I, that encourages me because that is the way out. For us to just face it and say, okay, now that we, like Drew Kuhn in your community, he works for the Water District. He's such a smart guy, and he is actually working on solutions. I mean, there are people in your community, Scott from Scott's Contracting, he's working on the soil remediation processes. There are people that are coming up with good ideas that are working, uh, and unfortunately, it seems like the... Uh, the government puts up these roadblocks for the average citizens to implement good ideas. So, but they're jumping through the they're jumping through the hoops to get it done. That's the <clears throat> that's the hopeful part is they are actually really doing it. It, uh-huh. it is it's very exciting. It's it's very it's very exciting actually to to think that people are really putting a line in the sand and say, wait a minute, we're going to figure this out instead of just you know crying about it. Right, uh, and I think I think we can be hopeful, and I I don't know. I guess I wish if like people who are listening to your program would just remember the word tritium <laughs> as as something that is generated in every nuclear power plant and also where nuclear weapons are produced and so forth. Um, and if they can just learn, tritium is radioactive hydrogen. It's a part of water. Uh, and it can it, it gives off radioactive beta particles, and you don't want to drink it, and you don't want to inhale it, and so forth. And that we can, and they cannot have nuclear power plants without releasing tritium into the air and into the water around the clock. And so, people who are drinking water that is downstream from nuclear power plants, they should be protesting and saying, "We want them all shut down," such as the people in New York City who are living near and, and downstream on the Hudson from from the from Indian Point. You know, we've got to just let people know just a few of the facts about why these technologies, nuclear power technologies and nuclear weapons, why these are so dangerous. And we're making more nuclear weapons, which is just simply unacceptable. We we're trying to shut down we're trying to get a, a radioactive waste dump here in St. Louis at Westlake Landfill on the in the Missouri River floodplain. We're trying to get that cleaned up. We want them to take the radioactive waste that were illegally, illegally dumped there in 1973. We want those dug up and taken out of the Missouri River floodplain. The wastes are in the Missouri River floodplain, and they the waste migrate into the Missouri River, which people drink, and then it goes into the Mississippi River, which a lot more people drink. So we've got to have people understand this and and know that we cannot have these dangerous technologies. Our planet will not tolerate them. Our public will not. And I think I, I just, you know, I, and, I, and I have a pamphlet that I wrote with a wonderful person, Carolyn Bauer, and our, one of our sentences is, our federal government creates nuclear weapons. As with other nuclear weapons waste sites, our federal government has the moral and fiscal responsibility to clean up the nuclear weapons waste at Westlake Landfill here in St. Louis and at very many other places. You know, I think the federal government shouldn't be making new wet nuclear weapons. They shouldn't be allowing nuclear power plants to operate. They shouldn't be allowed 
to be releasing these horrible radioactive particles and rays and and they have the federal government has the fiscal responsibility to clean them up and we must do that and we must stop generating more so we have a few minutes left do you think that protesting or getting signatures petitions visiting elected officials what works to stop the tide of you know the i mean what what can we do to put pressure on these elected officials what works wow. Well, you've, I think you've mentioned, you said protesting, and I think petitions are, I, I happen to be a petition addict, I guess. I've done, you know, put things on the ballot and so forth. I think the public can make a difference. You mentioned also visiting uh, elected officials, even if they just go to an office where there's a secretary and leave a written note saying what they believe, or phone, phone offices, you know, and there are free Mm -hmm. free numbers that you can use and just I think the public should feel responsible to try and participate in saying we want clean air, we want clean water, we want clean land we have one planet and I think you know the more people who express these concerns and, and urge their elected officials to do something I don't know what else we can how else we can hope to achieve change, Lonnie. We, I don't think we have other options. And I, you're trying to educate the public and giving people access to these inf this information. And it's, you know, a great service. And that's sort of the way our democracy works, and we have to take advantage of it. That's what I think. But, like, we just have to be that little gnat in the room that won't go away. Keep calling them. People say, well, it's not worth it. Yes, it is. Just keep putting pressure on them. Don't let them sleep at night. They have to hear that thousands and thousands and millions of people are saying no. They Like Claire McCaskill voting to cut the fuse wrap budget. I mean, Roy Blunt, we expected him to because his family evidently has a vested interest in Republic services. But Claire McCaskill is obviously just peer pressure. Pressured. You, I mean, I, I actually believe she's one of our better senators. I mean, I was dumbfounded when I read that. I could not believe it. But well, maybe, maybe you should maybe you them. should send your pardon me send your tape to her. <laughs> or, yes, you and know. you know what? Keep calling them and saying, you know what? Yeah. We need them to be willing to stand up and fight a little bit harder for us and not cave because there's not a lot of public pressure. I mean, this is the thing. This is one of the reasons the fuse wrap budget in St. Louis has not been funded. Everybody's fighting over a little tiny piece of the pie. We have big messes all over this country, and our country needs to get serious. We spend 60% almost of our national budget on creating war and building the military. We need to cut that in half and spend at least that 30% on fixing the chemical pollution and the uh, nuclear pollution that is destroying our country. Right. <clears throat> There's no way, there is no way that we ought to just be ignoring it. And I think it's a reasonable thing to say to our senators and congressmen, we need to cut the budget of the military and put some of that money in rebuilding our infrastructure and remediating all of the pollution and the chemical waste. In our we could build big industries. That could be, we could be a huge resurgence in our country of economic growth, just fixing the issues that we've created over the last hundred years so okay this hour has gone super fast i want to thank you uh k dry from beyond nuclear for joining me this morning it's been a really precious and valuable conversation with you today i want to thank you so much well lonnie thank you so much for your age of vision appreciate it well, I really appreciate you. And uh, to all of our listeners, put your courage feet on. Do take action. Call those elected officials. Sign the petitions. You know what? Do whatever you think of. Take action. We need millions of people to take action to save our planet. Thank you, Kay, for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.